What we'd like to talk about next is an area that's often confused. We'd like to tie anatomy into how you do a physical exam. Uh, a lot of students have difficulty with the fundoscopic exam and one thing that uh, is, is maybe helpful is if you think about the orbits Imagine an ice cream cone with the ice cream removed and the two cones are in the skull. If you think about that, they're not actually oriented parallel and straight in, but they're actually tilted in this direction. And so if you're doing a fundoscopic exam and you're trying to get to the bottom of the ice cream cone, um, you're going to notice that when you come in with your fundoscope, if you were to come straight in, you're really going to be looking at this aspect of the posterior orbit. And really you want to put yourself in alignment with the very uh, the very spot that's most distal in the bottom of the ice cream cone if you will and so by doing that you'll notice that you don't want to be straight in but at an oblique angle and when you come in you'll be in perfect alignment in thinking about that not only is it helpful with the physical exam but Dr. Pettis will go into the orientation of the extraocular muscles and it's very important to understand this configuration so that you'll better understand how the ocular movements uh, functionally work. What I want to talk about is the function of the extraocular muscles. Now it is very important that you be clear. What I'm talking about is the function, not the eye exam. Very often when I do this, the first gut reaction is that this is different from what we learn from someone else because they were talking about the eye exam. I want to talk about the biomechanics of the muscle and then we're going to talk about how this makes the eye exam makes sense. The two work very well together, but at first it seems counterintuitive, so bear with me for a moment. First, what Karen was just describing, two ice cream cones at an angle. You can see that right here. These represent the orbits, and we can see that the orbits themselves, or the eye cavities, diverge from one another. Just for the sake of simplicity, we'll just say 45 degrees, something around 45 degrees. Now if we go, these are my simplistic drawings of the eyes. And in order for us to understand what direction we're looking, I'm going to draw a big purple cornea looking straight ahead so that you can see one is looking this way and you have an arrow for a nose. Now let's look at the extraocular muscles which you already know the name of. Let's first start with the simple ones, the easiest ones. You can say the lateral rectus is very easy. It projects from the posterior orbit, from the apex of the orbit, and inserts on the eye here, on the, I, I exaggerate, but more on the anterior side of the eye. So you can see when this contracts on the axis with which the eye is rotating, you can see that it would turn the eye laterally. That's the lateral rectus innervated by cranial nerve 6. The next muscle I would like to mention is the medial rectus, the other most simple one. And it projects around the medial side of the eye. Once again, the rectus muscles all insert in the anterior hemisphere of the eye. So when it pulls, when it contracts, you can see that it would rotate the eye medially. That is the medial rectus, and that is innervated by cranial nerve number three, the oculomotor nerve. Next, I would like to talk about the other two rectus muscles, the superior rectus and the inferior rectus. And they're very similar. The difficulty with them is the same. So if you understand superior, you also understand inferior rectus. I'm not saying anything about the oblique muscles until I say it. So we're only talking rectus. In addition to the lateral rectus and the medial rectus, we want to talk about the superior and the inferior rectus. Let's just start with the superior rectus. Of course, its origin is back at the apex of the orbit, posterior orbit, and it inserts in the anterior hemisphere of the eye. So if we draw that muscle, a thin representation of that muscle so we can talk about the vector of its pull, the, it would pull the eye so that it would rotate elevating the cornea raising your gaze, raising your direction of gaze. But as you can see, because of this diverging ice cream cone formation that Karen talked about, it also would be pulling 
the anterior side of the eye medially. So we're pulling in the direction of this muscle as it contracts. We're pulling medially and we're also pulling posteriorly. If you're pulling this anterior aspect of the eye posteriorly, you're elevating the gaze. And if you're pulling the anterior aspect of the eye medially, you would also be adducting the eye. So you're doing both at once with the superior rectus. If we talk about the inferior rectus, we have the same vector pulling medially, except that instead of elevating the gaze, you're depressing the gaze. You're looking down with the inferior rectus muscle. These muscles, the superior rectus and the inferior rectus, are both innervated by cranial nerve number three. Now we begin talking about the oblique muscles, that is the superior oblique and the inferior oblique muscles, assuming that you already know the origin and insertion and the course of these muscles. The, so I will quickly mention the superior oblique, we know its origin is at the apex of the orbit, but remember it projects anteriorly through a trochlea, through the trochlea, which is essentially a pulley. So I'm just going to draw dotted lines. I don't want us to be distracted by that because as far as talking about the physics of this, the pole is from the trochlea or from the pulley uh, 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 toward the, for the superior oblique, the upper medial corner of the orbit. So this arrow shows you the direction of pole. The other important thing is that this muscle inserts in the posterior hemisphere of the eye. So that would be opposite effect from the rectus muscles. So that for the superior oblique, if we pull the posterior aspect of the eye superiorly on a rotation, the anterior side would look inferiorly. So if we pull this side of the eye superiorly, the cornea, the direction of view, would depress, would look down. In addition, once again, we can see this is going across the eye, and I should put the axis of rotation here. There's your axis of rotation. So, we are pulling that direction and that direction. So, anteriorly and medially, we are pulling. But the important thing to keep in mind is we're pulling the posterior aspect of the eye. So, although we're pulling medially, its effect on vision is going to be the opposite. This is the down and out muscle. The superior oblique, which is innervated by cranial nerve number four, pulls the direction of gaze inferiorly and uh, it abducts the eye. Now this is the part that's the opposite of what you learned in your eye exam. And this will make sense in a minute because we're talking about the function. What does this isolated muscle do? That's not the same thing as how we examine it. So, I hope you understand that. The inferior oblique uh, does the same thing in a medial lateral plane. It pulls the eye medially, except it does it from the underbelly of the eye instead of from superiorly. So it would elevate the anterior side and pull the anterior side laterally, causing you to look up and out. The inferior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve number three. So the mnemonic for all the cranial nerves and extraocular muscles is LR6, SO4, all else three. So lateral rectus, cranial nerve six, superior oblique, cranial nerve four, all of the other extraocular muscles, cranial nerve number three. Now I would like to switch over to the eye exam. The difference between what we were just speaking about function and the eye exam, which is going to be what you really need to know, is that in the eye exam, what you want to do is isolate the action of one muscle. Therefore, you ask them to do a movement that only that muscle can do, and if they can't do it, there's something wrong with that muscle or its nerve. So the easiest one to understand, the easiest two, are the lateral rectus. You ask the uh, individual to abduct the eye. If they cannot abduct the eye all the way, then the lateral rectus is having trouble. Same thing with the medial rectus. You ask them to adduct the eye and they cannot adduct the eye. Something is wrong with the medial rectus or the nerve that innervates it. 
The more difficult ones are the muscles that have two actions. As we've talked about, remember that the all, the, all the superior and inferior muscles do two things. Uh, medial and or superior and inferior movement of the eye. Or uh, lateral and superior and inferior movement of the eye. So let's talk about the superior rectus first. What you want to do is idealize the movement of this muscle. If you ask the person to look laterally or abduct the eye, you have at that time tested for the lateral rectus muscle. Once they have directed their gaze laterally, here's the axis of rotation, once they have directed their gaze laterally, then, then you ask them to look up, follow your finger up. And as you can see, at this point, once they have looked laterally, this superior rectus muscle is ideal. It is going right through the center of the eye. So there will be no medial movement of the eye by this muscle. In addition, the most important thing is that if we're looking at the uh, inferior oblique or the superior oblique at this time, going to their insertion, they are rendered less optimal. The oblique muscles going from the medial corner of the orbit go across the eye so that when this muscle contracts it will merely rotate the eye. So once we've looked laterally and we ask the person to look up, the only muscle that can do that is the superior rectus. In a normal position, when one is looking straight ahead, if you ask them just to look up, follow your finger up, that could be either the inferior oblique muscle or the superior rectus. However, if we looked laterally first, we uh, position the eye so that the inferior oblique is not working very well. It certainly is not elevating the eye. It may rotate the eye. Now let's, we'll have a better understanding of this if we actually talk about how we test the oblique muscles. If we ask the patient to follow your eye medially, so they're looking at their nose, you will see that then the superior rectus muscle and the inferior rectus muscle are themselves then rendered less effective. And they are now in a position where they would be more likely to rotate the eye than to actually elevate the eye. If we look at the inferior oblique or superior oblique muscle at that time, when one is looking medially, this muscle is then optimized. It's going right across, almost right across the axis of rotation so that the inferior oblique will cause elevation of the gaze and the superior oblique will cause the patient to look down. So, if you ask the person to follow your finger so that they're looking toward their nose, looking medially, and then follow your finger up and they cannot do that, then their inferior oblique muscle is not working very well. If you ask them to look at their nose and then follow your finger down and they cannot do that, then it is their superior oblique muscle that is not working well. You see, the, in this instance, the, medial, the uh, superior rectus and the inferior rectus muscles cannot help. They cannot cover up the impaired function of the oblique muscles.